a lot of people are interested, what makes a hit record? And ABBA really, really knew how to do it. From 1974 to 1982, ABBA established themselves as the unassailable parapets of pop perfection. Every single was a major event, selling in quantities so vast and in places so theretofore untouched by pop music that it staggered the imagination. Across 1975 and 76, they seemed to be this unstinting wall of music that enveloped the globe. Part of their charm was that they came from what was then a pop backwater in Sweden, and their success seemed everywhere except in the pop headwater of America. And their image was unique. Two romantic couples, very attractive people from exotic and liberal Sweden, all hinting at behind-the-scenes sexy shenanigans of various sordid stripes, singing sing-along smash hit songs of sunshine. From 1977, though, a sadness seemed to enter the music, which by the end was overwhelming, so much so that it did make them seem, at the time, one of the few bands who chose exactly the right time to go their separate ways. The band began simply as an idea that bided its time to become a good one, and then became a very good one indeed. And after that idea had run its course, the human factors, the heartbreak, the fear, the anger, and the betrayal caused it all to end, behind all the noble smiles, in tragedy. In the 1960s, Sweden enjoyed a thriving local pop scene. Both beat groups and folk groups mingled on the charts and recorded in both the English and Swedish languages, as well as the German Schlager style, a rowdy sing-song type of pop music. In 1963, a handsome 18-year-old folk singer, Bjorn Ulvaeus, who fronted a band called the West Bay Singers, attracted the attention of Stig Anderson, who was in the music publishing business. Stig was impressed by a song they entered in a radio talent contest, drove the four hours south from Stockholm to Vashtevik, where he told the band that if they switched to an all-Swedish repertoire and changed the name to the Hootenanny Singers, he'd sign them to his company Polar Music, so they could go professional as soon as they finished school. Meanwhile, one of the shaggy-haired beat groups who sprung up in the afterglow of the Beatles' fireball was the Hep Stars. Late in 1964, they were looking for an organ player and settled on a round-faced, perpetually smiling wizard of the instrument, Guran Benny Anderson. The fact that Benny had the hippest haircut on the scene was apparently the clincher in his joining. Soon, the prodigiously gifted Benny was writing original songs for the band, and by the end of 1966, the Hep Stars were the biggest beat group in Sweden. The Hootenanny singers had kept up, though, and had adopted a more folk rock sound by then. But there was a problem. Sweden at the time still had mandatory military service, and all three Hootenanny singers were called up at the same time. The night before they had to report, they threw a going-away party of sorts after their last gig and invited a whole bunch of other musicians to join them. Amongst those who turned up around 2am was Benny Anderson. The morning dawned with Bjorn and Benny, who got on from the moment they first met, sitting in a freezing park playing Beatles songs on their guitars. The year in the army put a crimp on the Hootenanny's career. It didn't kill it, but they could only play and record on weekends. Over that year, Bjorn and Benny started working together. Bjorn sat in with the Hepcats one night when their guitarist bailed, and Benny helped out the Hoots. By 1969, though, Bjorn was sick of being in the folk-singing straitjacket, and he made a solo record. One night on a television show to promote it, he met the woman with whom he would become inseparably intertwined in the public's mind, Agnetha Felchskog. Agnetha was, at the time she met Bjorn, a much bigger star than him, having had many self-penned hits, outselling even the Beatles. She'd had a rough time of it in the business, though. A country girl, she'd come to Stockholm, where she'd had her first hit, and then moved to Berlin to record German-language singles, all of which flopped. She got engaged to her producer, who soon dumped her, and by the middle of 1969, she was back in Stockholm, her confidence shot and her heart broken. When Bjorn met her, he fell head over heels in love, as he says, at first sight. Agnetha was more pragmatic. I felt, she said, that we were maritally compatible. Annefried Lingstadt had come into the mix via a far more roundabout route. She was the child of a Norwegian girl and an occupying German soldier born in Bjorkassen, near Narvik, six months after the war ended. Her father was reported killed at the very end of the war as he was evacuated back to Germany. Her mother, who found out some months after Annefried was born that her father had been killed, was inconsolable and died a short time after, aged only 21. Annefried was brought up by her grandmother, who, knowing that we Norwegians are an unforgiving peoples, decided it prudent to emigrate to nearby Sweden, choosing the pretty village of Eskilchuna, about an hour and a half west of Stockholm. Annefried was a happy child who loved to sing, especially jazz. 
Encouraged by her gran, she was singing professionally at 13 and was fronting, like Agnetha had, a big band at 16. She fell in love with the band's bass player, married him at 18 and by 21 had two kids. In 1967, after an appearance on TV, she was offered a recording contract with EMI. So it was Bye Bye Bass as she opted for a life in the limelight, moving to Stockholm to become a big star. In early 1969, she met Benny Anderson while recording a radio quiz show. Within months, they were engaged and Bjorn and Agnetha followed shortly after. Bjorn and Benny recorded an album together, Lika, but it was a middling effort and despite finding a level of domestic happiness, the couples found themselves professionally increasingly on the outer in the public taste. The foursome made their public debut with a disastrous engagement at a top restaurant cabaret in Gothenburg, presenting skits, comedy songs and cover versions. By the end of their engagement, more people were on the stage than were in the audience. Disaster was averted when the girls encouraged Bjorn and Benny to release a single from Lika, Hey Old Man, which was a big hit. It was kind of terrible, but it rekindled a little interest in their careers, and when Bjorn and Agnetha were married in July 1971, thousands of fans mobbed the wedding, where Benny played the wedding march on the organ and snuck in an old Hepstars hit for good measure. The marriage got off to an inauspicious start, however, when a police horse controlling the crowd stepped on and broke Agnetha's foot. But that was nothing compared to the thunderstorm that broke once the ceremony was over. Bent Bernhag, the man who was Stig Anderson's partner in Polar Music, the company that gave Bjorn his start in the industry, and was later to guide the career of ABBA, had committed suicide on the morning of the wedding. Stig, who was like an older brother to both Bjorn and Benny, was overwhelmed with grief. The foursome looked for a time like they'd lose their manager and mentor, but Stig decided to go all in on the project and offered Bjorn a 50% share in the company. Bjorn said he'd only come in on the partnership if Benny got half of Bjorn's stake. The couples moved into the same neighbourhood in Stockholm and Benny and Bjorn worked much like a Swedish Vander and Young on hits for other polar artists, plus for Agnetha and Annie Fried, who sought now to be known professionally as Frida, and even had a hit of their own in Japan. Benny, however, had begun a slide into alcoholism that was to plague him for the next 30 years. The girls started appearing more and more prominently on the boys' recordings as well. This reached ahead with 1972's People Need Love, credited to Bjorn and Benny and Agnetha and Frida, which, to all intents and purposes, is the first real ABBA single. And it's great. A solid, bopping Schlager-style song sung in English, it made number two in Sweden, and hit the charts in Holland. The next single, however, Here's Your Brother, flopped. Stig suggested that the band should look at wider markets in Sweden, and they put forward their next single, again as Bjorn and Benny and Agnetha and Frida, as the prospective entrance in that year's Eurovision Song Contest. That record was, of course, Ring Ring, which long-term viewers of this channel will know I consider to be one of the best and most underrated ABBA songs. Featuring the girls as the lead vocal instead of the usual Bjorn, they played it at the Swedish leg of the contest with Agnetha a few days overdue to give birth, but the song didn't qualify and the winner, a tedious dirge which sounded a lot like the Bee Gees called You Are the Summer went on to finish fifth. Stig, who could not conceal his disappointment, sprouted, People are not as stupid as you think. They're even more stupid. Ring Ring did really well, though, in Sweden. The Swedish version made number one, the English version made number two, and the album top three. It peaked into the Australian top 100 at 93 for a week, but unwisely remixed for the American market, stiffed. There were to be no such disappointments in 1974 as Waterloo not only won the Eurovisions, but was a huge hit. Number one in ten European countries, including France, Germany and the UK. Number two in two others, number four in Australia and number six in the USA. It was the beginning of one of the most phenomenal runs in music history. Six Swedish number ones, six in Australia, nine in Germany, nine in the UK. In the USA, though, it was just a solitary number one and three other top tens. It's an enduring mystery and one I would be much indebted to my viewers for opinions as to why that ABBA never dominated in the US the way they did elsewhere. The mystery of America notwithstanding, the glory years were good to ABBA. As Bjorn and Benny became au fait with the more sophisticated production techniques and devices, a distinctive, highly polished sound began to emerge and the simpler Schlager styles began to recede. Two factors came into this. Bjorn and Benny both became big fans of contemporary American Top 40, but they and their band were very nuanced in the way they incorporated the ideas, from sources as diverse as Philly Soul, American Stadium acts like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac, and the sheenier English acts, Roxy Music and Queen, and they laid those sounds over a pulsing Eurobeat provided by wonder bassist Rutger Gunnarsson, who had been in the Hootenanny Singers with Bjorn, and drummers Roger Palm and later Ola Blinkert and Per Lindvall. They weren't immune to some cheesy moments still, though, take a chance on me, Chikatita, and even the 14-week-in-my-hometown number one Fernando. 
But for all of 1976 with the Arrival album and 1977's even more musically sophisticated ABBA The Album, they swept everything before them. ABBA The Album, anchored by the glorious The Name of the Game, was a remarkably confident record, given that it was written and recorded against a backdrop of pressures that the band had never before experienced. 1977 saw their first extended touring, Agnetha's difficult pregnancy, Frida actually had to double a lot of what would have been Agnetha's parts on ABBA The Album when she wasn't available, and pressure to have that record ready for the Christmas market, it missed by a month coming out a bare fortnight before the holidays. But the stresses that band were exposed to across those two years began to tell, not just the musical and interpersonal ones, but the business of running Polar, which began to weigh on Bjorn and Benny. Given Sweden's draconian tax laws, Anderson had decided to diversify the Polar portfolio, involving Bjorn and Benny in businesses they had no interest in and, as artistic types, found distasteful. He also bought out Frieda and Agnetha's contracts with their record labels, effectively ending their solo careers. Across the first months of 1977 on tour, a situation the anxious Agnetha found distressing, but the more ebullient Frida lived for. It was also becoming apparent that Agnetha and Bjorn were spending much less time together. While he's always denied it, perhaps a rival's second masterpiece, Knowing Me, Knowing You, was an unknowing window into Bjorn's concerns for the shape of his marriage. Must be said, though, those lyrics were written by Stig Anderson. By the time the band got back from Australia in March 1977, Agnetha was in pretty bad shape psychologically. Not having her solo career to invest in and seeking some kind of insulation from the pressure of the band, she demanded of Bjorn another child. Frida, in the meantime, had her own unexpected dramas. Her father, long since considered killed at the end of World War II, turned up alive and well, a prosperous businessman from Karlsruhe, Germany. Interestingly, in 1977, Debbie Boone had a 10-week number one hit in the US with You Light Up My Life. The B-side, which would have earned the same publishing royalties as the A-side, was Bjorn and Benny's Hasta Manana. Nice bit of pocket money there. After the birth of their son, Bjorn and Agnetha's marriage deteriorated markedly. A new US deal with Atlantic very much increased the pressure on Bjorn and Benny as the label began to suggest changes to their approach to accommodate the American market, and teething problems in the new Polar Studios, which Stig had purpose-built for them, also played on their minds. These, combined with mounting personal issues, meant that the album Voulez Vous was pushed back from its late 1978 slated release to April 1979. The personal issues were, as it turns out, pretty significant. In October 1978, Benny and Frieda quietly married, ending a nine-year engagement. But that was overshadowed by the final collapse of Bjorn and Agnetha's marriage, which resulted in Bjorn finally moving out of the family home on Christmas Eve 1978. I was a bachelor for a week, offered Bjorn, because at Benny and Frieda's New Year's Eve party, he met Lena, his future wife of 40 years, who was a dead ringer for Agnetha. So you could say he definitely had a type. The 1979 album Voulez Vous is a strange beast. It's the first time ABBA sound behind the times as opposed to outside of them, given the album with its heavy disco inflections was released after the disco wave had receded. It was a dispiriting time for the band. Agnetha said she could tell from the look in Bjorn's eye when he came home from the studios each day how badly that day's work had gone. Benny shared the pessimism, telling a journalist he couldn't see ever getting the album done. They hadn't had a hit for some time, so in late 1978 they rushed out Summer Night City, despite not being happy with it. It broke their run at number one in the UK, topping out at five. The album's had its moments, The King Has Lost His Crown, The Slightly Creepy Does Your Mother Know, and The Unfairly Maligned Summer Night City, but it does have the first two ABBA songs that really outstay their welcome, the title track and the schlager throwback Chikatita. To promote the album, the band took to the road again, this time crisscrossing America against the backdrop of Bjorn and Agnetha, finally filing for divorce. Agnetha was in terrible shape for the tour, resenting being separated from her children, gripped with stage fright and terrified of flying. Benny and Bjorn, however, still considered it a matter of honour to drink every journalist who parted with them under the table at every opportunity. Into 1980, things took an even darker turn for the band. Stig Anderson, who was now withdrawing from the day-to-day -day with the band and was concentrating on running the corporations he'd founded as tax shelters, came under suspicion for not paying said sheltered taxes on behalf of the band. This was the beginning of the end of their relationship, which, in the legal sense, would barely outlast the band. Super Trooper came in 1980, by which time Agnetha and Bjorn had finalised their divorce. A much more pop-oriented record, it contained The Winner Takes It All, a meditation on that divorce which was the ultimate vindication of the old right drunk edit sober policy, which Bjorn considered his finest lyric, even if he later saw it as bitterly ironic. There were no winners in our divorce, he came to admit. When it came to recording, Benny assumed that Bjorn would sing it, but to Bjorn it was obvious that only Agnetha could sing it. Her fragile lyric soprano was much better suited than his reedier, less emotive voice, 
or Frida's Stagia Mezzo. It's magnificent, one of the very finest records they ever made. After the Russian push of Voulez Vous, this was the all-too-human face of the band. In November 1980, without any indication whatsoever, Benny announced to Frida that he was in love with another woman and he wanted a divorce immediately. Frida was naturally devastated, and as the divorce rushed through in February 1981, she still hadn't recovered as the band reconvened a month after that to record their eighth album. If there ever was a final album that said this is the final album, it was The Visitors. There's a pall of gloom over it. The songs are dark in their themes, and the personal politics in the room were, if not destructive, certainly very unhealthy. The cover art was a real clue. Frida was still furious with Benny and was not talking to Agnetha, who she felt hadn't offered her any support, and Agnetha had fallen into a deep depression. Benny was drinking heavily. The band had intended to record the album using the brand new digital technology and the 32-track desk had been installed at Polar. As it happened, their faithful engineer Michael Tretow, along with Ragnar Gunnarsson, the other unofficial hero of the ABBA story, had not only to figure out how to use the new technology, and that meant a lot of retakes, which frayed the girls' tempers all the more. Of course, there's a masterpiece on it, The Heart-Rending One of Us, the sort of inevitable sequel to Knowing Me, Knowing You, although The Day Before You Came is another wrongfully overlooked gem. The album sold barely half the copies of Super Trooper. Soon after The Visitors was released, it became apparent that Stig Anderson had either willfully or incompetently mismanaged Bjorn, Benny, and to some extent Frida's financial business. Frida sold her share she had in Polar in 1982. Bjorn and Benny sold off their share to Polydor in 1984. Bjorn, Benny and Agnetha then all proceeded to sue Anderson for non-payments of royalties and for exposing them to penalties for non-payment of taxes. Anderson sold his share of Polydor in 1989 and that share included the rights to the ABBA trademark. By the time he died in 1993, only Bjorn and Benny remained friends. Every other thing that they'd built was either broken, sold off or increasingly forgotten as time moved on. Is there a happy ending? Maybe, sort of. Agnetha and Frieda both had moderate successes in their solo careers. Agnetha's ending after a crash forced her into semi-retirement, and Frieda has proven that living well is the best revenge, marrying money twice, and now having the greatest estimated net worth of any of the four. In Australia, always ABBA's most dedicated market, the band was considered almost persona non grata for many, many years until PJ Hogan's 1994 film Muriel's Wedding reintroduced the band's music to a wide audience, and suddenly ABBA were huge again. In 1999, the jukebox musical Mamma Mia debuted. It's estimated this and the two subsequent films have made Bjorn and Benny, who got sober in 2001 and have stayed so since, more money than all of their days in ABBA and has defined the band in the eyes of a whole new generation of fans. There was a reunion in 2016. The four members appeared on stage together and in April 2018, they entered a recording studio and lay down two tracks. In November 2021, the Voyage album was released. Like all Abra albums, it's a mix of the good and the not-so-good, but unlike all their previous work, the good here was merely good. There was no one of us or winner takes it all or name of the game to anchor it. While a pale shadow of their best, it's good we had Voyager for closure, because it would be difficult to walk away from this with just a story of how four wonderfully talented people who loved each other so dearly and trusted their friend and business partner succumbed to the cruel vicissitudes of the industry and ended up almost destroying themselves and their legacy in the process, because all they gave to us was joy. And that's what we should remember about ABBA, that they were what music should be all about, joy in the darkness, the comfort for our sorrowful dreams. (laughs) 